I just wanted to acknowledge that I'm joining, like many of you, from the territories of the Musqueam, the Skohomish, and the Tsleil-Waututh peoples here in what is now known as Vancouver, British Columbia. Um, and in addition to those wonderful things that, that Joan shared about me, I'm perhaps most importantly a daughter, a sister, an auntie to nine beautiful nieces and nephews, and I'm a lover of all things aquatic and a proud member and citizen of the Niska Nation in, in northern British Columbia, and pleased to be here tonight. So I'm going to turn things over to, to Spencer to, to introduce himself as well. Thanks, Andrea, uh, and, and thanks for that wonderful introduction. I, uh, as you can see, uh, a telephone number shows up on the screen, and I'm going to try to start my video so I can at least say hi to everyone, and you can put a face to this voice. Um, and I'll probably freeze because the internet connection. We'll see how long it lasts. Uh, but yeah, I, uh, as mentioned, I'm a from of the Gizkata people, my Tsimsian name is Lagod, and I love fish. And so <laughs> that's why I'm here today. Our people love fish. And if I understand correctly, I'm gonna be starting the presentation. Um, but Will, do you want to give a quick introduction before I start? And and then, yeah, yeah you then I can dive thanks. right in. Awesome. Hey everybody, my name is Will Atlas. I am currently in Squamish Nation territory on the Chequemus River, um, living out in a cabin here. So you'll have to bear with me if my bandwidth is a little uh, not ideal as well. But um, I grew up in Seattle. I've been in BC for the last 12 years. I also love salmon uh, and I work primarily on the central coast of BC, work closely with First Nations as well as government and nonprofit organizations to try to protect uh, and really uphold the values around salmon and social ecological systems and um, I'm looking forward to this uh, tonight. So thank you so much for the invitation to be here and I'll uh, mute myself. Nice, we're good, I hope. <laughs> so there's that beautiful long title, um, <laughs> Revitalizing Indigenous Systems of Management for Resilient Pacific Salmon Fisheries and Communities. My hope today is to, to, or right now in the introduction, is to be able to take that title, turn it into something big that hopefully I can translate through my own lens and how I see this, and uh, and my colleagues and the professionals who will be uh, discussing after me will be able to nail that point home and paint that picture even better than I. So here's the hoping. Um, I think the, first, the place to start with this is to understand that there's this, this thing called Indigenous resource management or this phenomenon of Indigenous management. And uh, maybe some people listening have heard about this and talked about this. Maybe some people haven't. But I thought this would be a good place to start. And in, really, the place to start is to ask ourselves, what is management? And I like to start these conversations by getting everyone to imagine resource management as we know it as a blank slate. When we think of resource management in, uh, in mainstream society or in the industrialized West, we often think of resource extraction and, and how we use resource extraction to fuel this Western society. But in reality, resource management is, is, is just a tool. It's this term that kind of describes how we want to use resources to fit our needs. And it only really holds values or certain aspects when there is a user or a culture attached to it. So I often imagine if we think of it as a tool, resource management or management of ecosystems in itself, it, you can imagine it like a hammer or even a paintbrush and how it's done or how it's used is informed by the user. Every artist is going to use that paintbrush differently. Every carpenter is going to use the hammer differently when they build a house. They might be given the same materials, but they're gonna build something different 
an artist might be given some materials and each artist will have their own creation. And so human societies have been doing that as well with ecosystems. And so when I speak of indigenous management, it's just the how our people on the coast and in particular salmon people, and in my case, the Tsimsian people, the Gitsata of the Tsimsian people, the Gitka First Nation, have come to that phenomenon of how, what do we want these resources to do? And, and, and how do we influence them so they do what we want? So I think it's becoming more and more obvious that in the Western world, management has happened largely based on this equation of profit. And only now are, is, is the sustenance at the forefront of these conversations. But still, um, in, in a past life, I was working in politics for my nation. And we would sit at the negotiation tables with governments and, and DFO, and uh, whether it's the province or the feds, often resources are, these discussions, the end game is based on a budget or what needs to be met. And that's a cultural influence on management. But for indigenous people, the end game is sort of based on sustenance because we as indigenous people understand that we're kind of at the whim of salmon on the coast. They're our lifeblood, they're everything. You imagine how money influences today's society. Well, that's how salmon influenced us for thousands of years. It, it, it made our, our life roll. And, and so we were at the whim of salmon. So it led to a very different relationship uh, as what we might see in the industrial West. So sometimes I also like to think of, of this idea of indigenous management and I like to boil it down to some sort of research question. Like if we could imagine what our people, if they had a research question when they came to first seeing salmon or seeing how important salmon was, I like to think that their research question would be something like, how do we ensure that our harvest produces the best results for us and the salmon? Because we know at that we are, we are so vulnerable to their population. And through that sort of research question, it led to an inquiry, an inquiry of laws and governance and protocols and a spirituality that became institutionalized and legalized and in, in, in a culture. I, I show these pictures here, these three, pic, three pictures, because sometimes those laws that came from these relationships with ecosystems end up on the landscape too. And those landscapes become an archive of, of like a library. On the right-hand side here, you see some red paint on a rock, and that's, that's a, a, what we would call a pictograph, depicting some sort of, there's, there's a legal characteristic of that on a, in a harvesting or a stewardship boundary. And, and sometimes in petroglyphs in the rocks, there's stories and laws carved into them. And then in the bottom picture is this island in our territory, in a place where I do most of my research. It's entirely human made. And uh, it was made around this place that's a hot spot for harvesting salmon. And so there's all kinds of stories and, and, and protocols to follow when living on that island. But I sort of I digress again. Um, all of these sort of these guidelines, let's say, let's say it was a rule book or a guideline, turns into law and just like how canada as a country manages ecosystems they do that through law and it just so happens that these laws come from a relationship with non-human species and we're actively engaging with non-human species in a way that they continue to just like our Senate and our, and our elected representatives in Canada decide and, and, and change laws and do these things. It's not only humans to us, but it's also species that help us brainstorm these laws and these guidelines. And they become institutionalized. In one picture, this is, just happens to be me um, 
speaking with my chiefs at a, a at a potlatch, and and, and what that is representative of is this a hereditary traditional system, which is a term some people might have heard. Hereditary system, essentially the governance and law we used prior to colonization, which has been described by, as by many as just as complex, if not more complex than today's parliament. But in this picture, it's my lineage with my elders, my chief. And we represent one portion of the territory that we steward. And we steward that based on our relationship with that ecosystem and the lessons we've learned from that. And so I, I think I just, I really wanted to include this to, to emphasize that that governance and law is, is very closely connected to the ecosystems that we live in because they were the foundation of it. But to get back to salmon management and, uh, and, and actually learning and, and living with, with salmon, uh, I, I included a couple slides here in that Salmon is a very prominent, ex or fish in general is a very prominent, uh, or, or, or it, it's a prominent species for our people on the coast. We, um, uh, like I said, they just drove our economy. They're the reasons that that lineage of my lineage in that picture, we steward the ter territory we steward because it was a salmon river. And, and that allowed us to thrive as a species that created this rich, culture and civilization but we had to do that by learning to live with species and when i when i come to this conversation there's this uh this quote that i found by uh an ojibwe author that i really love the author is richard richard wagamese and in this book he, he, put, he wrote, it's called Embers, and it's kind of snippets of his thoughts in, in, in philosophies around indigenous knowledge and ways of being. And, and in, in one of the conversations, he's talking to an elder, and in the book it says, he comes to that, comes to that elder saying, what is the point of prayer and meditation? And that elder, she says, to bring you closer to the great mystery. And by great mystery, they mean spirit or spirituality. And he responds, so I can understand it? And she says, no, so you can participate in it. And something I found myself talking about in my research is how we sort of lost in Western society the importance of participating in an ecosystem. And what species can often do, if you're listening, is tell you how to participate. And I have a couple examples here. Uh, the first example is one of my favorite, and I talk about this in my thesis. And in, in our culture, we have the story of the mountain goats bringing down our society. And uh, because we're not living correctly and we're disobeying and and they come to us and they give us a set of laws to follow. And to compare this to Western science, uh, the goats didn't come and say, study us and learn about every molecule of us. And then you're going to be the best version of a human. They didn't say, if you know every bit about me, you're going to be uh, the best version of yourself. What they did say is, if you live with us and, and respect these boundaries and sort of create this marriage and, and understand how to live with us in a good way, that's when you become the best version of a human. And, and this translates to sort of all species is that when you learn to live with them as if it is a marriage and this commitment to understanding each other's boundaries, that's when you become almost the most 
I sometimes I refer to it as like the most mature version as humans can be because you you become the most when you're existing in a particular ecosystem you become the most well-rounded in knowing how to live with it and live amongst it that's me spying on goats in the picture but the next picture beside it is a clam garden and the same rules apply to that humans on the coast learned how to live with clam garden or with clams and they developed these things called clam gardens which maybe people have heard of or talked about they've been big news sort of on the resource management world in academia where they would manipulate beaches creating these gardens and they would grow up to four times more they would be healthier they would grow four times more in numbers and in size and so this this idea that we don't just grow we shouldn't as humans just study things and grow our brain as if it's having a giant encyclopedia of a brain is the be-all end-all the be-all end-all is learning how to actually live with these species and luckily there's this expression in our cultures on the coast when it comes to how we do that with salmon and i'll end my portion of this this presentation uh, with some examples in, in, in our culture and potentially in Andrea's and the, the Niska, the uh, Gixen, the uh, Haida, the Clinket. We have all these stories of how salmon shaped us and told us how to live amongst them and in a sense, be married to them. This, there's this book that's widely spread and, and, and the stories across the coast of the prince and the salmon people, this prince gets sucked down into the water by the salmon. And he's shown all these ways and how the humans are harvesting in the wrong way. And the salmon teach him the laws he needs to bring up to the human world in order to harvest in the right way. There's a picture of a, a bullhead in the pic in my slide here. And, um, we have a story when it comes to harvesting ulekin, the kayet, we call it, the bullhead. The kayet comes up to us during a time of starvation, and there's this woman by the river. And the kayet, they have this conversation, and he decides he's going to teach the humans something. And he says, watch me how I, how I feast on, and harvest these ulekin. And you're going to build a net that, that is modeled after me. And you're, you're going to fish it how I fish. And when you do that, you're going to fish these ulekin in a good way and your people will thrive, as will the ulekin. In the corner, there's a picture of my brother and one of my elders building an ulekin net. And it, above that is this beautiful rock wall in this territory that I do my research. But all in all, these stories have, of, of, of animals have, have shown how they have given us these laws. And we've sort of respected that, that indefinite marriage between human and non-human for the time being by institutionalizing these laws and including them in our governance structures, into our everyday life. And when we do that, we can see some of the most beautiful examples of human ingenuity like how fishing and harvesting can make more resilient and numerous salmon numbers, even though intuitively we think extracting is kind of bad. That's not the case. And hopefully um, Andrea and, and Will can, can show examples of that as well, how, how traditional harvesting methods can do that. And when we participate in these ecosystems with these laws, we can actually help it thrive as opposed to seeing ourselves as this negative on the landscape. And so with that, I'll, I'll pass it over. I'll stop sharing and pass it over. Thank you, Spencer, for that remarkable beginning. That was, that was really wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, it was great to learn from you in this way, and I wish we could all be in the same room together, but hopefully we can get there one day. So. Neat, hello again, everyone. Um, and welcome to this space, this subsection of, of the presentation that's created explicitly to honor and improve our collective understanding and appreciation of salmon people relationships in which we'll focus on 
the ethics, practices, and principles, many of which um, Spencer has just introduced for us, that, that have arisen from thousands of years of coexistence and interdependence between Han, meaning fish in Niska, but especially salmon, and indigenous peoples across the Pacific Northwest. As I introduced, I'm a citizen of the Niska Nation. My father's family name is Stuart, and on his side, we hail from the oceanmost Niska village of Gingol, just at the very base of the Alaska Panhandle. And following the matrilineal line of my Gigi, my grandmother, my father belongs to the Giskast or Killer Whale Clan and to uh, Wilp Dakin. On my mother's side, the Canes were of Irish descent and I was raised by the sea like those before me on what is now known as Prince Edward Island, also known as Epicwit, meaning lying in the water in Mi'kmaq, in Mi'kma'ki, the homeland of the Mi'kmaq people. The words that I share here therefore reflect the learning of Han people relationships that I have undertaken and sought out as an adult, reconnecting to a large part of my heritage that I did not have the privilege to grow up immersed within. I'll continue to, wor to use Niska words throughout this section of tonight's talk to, to highlight the power of Indigenous languages to lend insight in conversations of this nature, but not to give the impression of any degree of fluency on my part. I am a learner now and always, and it's my gift as well as my responsibility as a Giscast descendant to give life to the knowledge that has been imparted on me. My elders tell me to practice and to use the language, so I follow their instruction here where I can. In my career as a salmon scientist, as a fish biologist, I've learned both from the fish themselves as well as from the knowledge keepers who keep systems of knowing and being alive in Indigenous communities through language, story, ceremony, practice, and law. It is their teachings that I transmit here for collective benefit. And what I share here is not meant to represent the nature of all Han people relationships, but rather it's an amalgam of principles and lessons that I've come to learn through my work and time and community. It's important to recognize here as everywhere that indigenous peoples and indigenous knowledges are not a monolith, hence why I refer to them as people and knowledge in the plural form. They vary in really important ways. They do, however, also share important parallels when it comes to this particular set of identity defining and cultural keystone species, the salmon. I, like many before me, including Spencer, believe that these concepts are ones that hold the power to transform mainstream human salmon relationships for the better if some of their core teachings were to permeate more fully into how we collectively so-called manage and interact with Han today. Many of my teachers have stressed that these are relationships characterized by reciprocity, the practice of exchanging with others for mutual benefit, a concept that extends well beyond people to be inclusive of all our relations. It culminates in entire fishing ethics in bodies of practice and principles that guide how people and salmon can live in reciprocal relationships with one another. As noted by a Shekwetmuk knowledge keeper to me during my doctoral research, which I completed last year. Wild salmon are our relatives and they're our most important food. Talking about wild salmon as a resource to be exploited as opposed to an intimate relative are two very contradicting ways of relating to wild salmon. It goes against the indigenous concept of all our relations. Over the course of my doctorate, I spent time in 18 communities across the three largest home rivers for Han in the province today, the Fraser, the Skeena, and the Nass rivers, the Nass being home of the Niska. The methods that I used to learn about Han are detailed in my dissertation, which I'd be happy to share with anyone who's interested. And here with permission, I'm gonna share words and wisdom from those who were willing to share their time and knowledge with me during my PhD. So I'll start with something very foundational of taking only that which is given to us and taking only what you need. These are critical 
guidelines repeated to me across community contexts, Aniska, Ma Aniska Matriarch affirmed for me that the old people never waste any food any. They respect the land we're in, eh? The waters, the earth. They respect the food too. They always tell you, you never get more than what you need. Only get what you can use and share with others. In Lillooet, in very clear parallel, a Statlium elder stated that we were raised to take what you need. If you take more than you need, then you give away what you don't need. And if you take it and let it go to rot, then the next time you need something, you're not going to get it. That's how I was raised, just like the berries. If you pick lots of berries and your basket is full, but you still keep putting more in and all of a sudden you fall, all your berries go. That's what my grandma told me. Only pick what you need. Next, knowledge keepers often spoke to me about a need to ask permission, as, as Spencer just made clear, to listen for the answer, bringing ceremony into fishing and harvesting practices. Why do we use tobacco? We use tobacco for permission. When I take something from the land, I offer tobacco. This was noted to me by a hereditary chief in the Lake Babine Nation. Another Niska elder simply and eloquently said, we have to share, we have to respect, we have to listen to nature. Respect is shown for Han when you minimize harm, when you use everything that you take and never take all that you see. A Lake Babin Fisher reflected on teachings that she received from her elders. All they told us was that, was that we are not allowed to fool around with fish. You've got to respect that. And that's what we've been doing. Like you can't just catch it and throw it away. A Niska chief echoed the importance of avoiding waste, saying that when our people use the salmon, process the salmon in the way our ancestors did. There's very little of the salmon itself that is wasted, which gets thrown away. Very little, almost all of it is used to ensure that not too many salmon are taken by one individual or for any one family. A Shalath counselor noted that the first fish you catch, you let it go, right? So it goes. That is respect for the salmon. Han as I and Spencer have noted, are not simply natural resources to be extracted for exclusively economic gain, which is the very definition of a natural resource if you go look it up. They are our relatives that we must treat with respect if we expect this relationship to continue beyond the short term. A spiritual leader in the Hoiston community spoke to how we can reciprocate the gift and be grateful recalling the first salmon ceremony that takes place each year upon the return of the first salmon across communities throughout the Pacific Northwest. He said, that's what the salmon ceremony is, catching them. And as soon as you catch them from the river, you put in a little bit of tobacco and tell them, tell the Fraser, thank you for sending me that salmon that we need to nourish our bodies. And he extended his gratitude to many saying, thank you creator for the fish you sent up so that my people will not starve. And thank you for the river. And I pray that you cleanse our waters so that we can drink anywhere that we are at. The connection between the health of Han, the health of people and the health of the river was not lost on any knowledge keeper or elder that I had the privilege of listening to. And these features of living in reciprocity with Han have been purposefully created and practiced so that we can collectively maintain healthy relationships between fish people in place and do our fishing in a good way that does not upend that balance that exists between all that live together in our shared landscapes and waterways. And I'd like to close out my section by sharing an example of how many of these principles are embodied in the systems of management employed by the Niska Fisheries and Wildlife Department in their management, study and protection of salmon fisheries in the Nass River. As fellow co-author, Nicole Morvan, Cole Morvan, uh, Harvest Monitor Coordinator with Niska Fish, as she and I detail in a, in a section on fish wheels in our collaborative paper that we're here to share tonight, which was led by Will and collaborated on by Cole Spencer, myself, and a, and a list of others. 
Um, fish wheels are these ancient fishing technologies originally constructed from cedar wood and nettle fiber mesh, now modernized and made out of aluminum and nylon netting. They're mounted on these floating platforms and have multiple baskets that are being revolved by the river's current. And these baskets are designed to catch fish and then to carry them into these submerged holding pens. The fish can then be dip netted out and assessed or sampled by technicians using a flow through trough before they're released, before they're released unharmed or retained for food. In the words of Niska Samagat, or Chief Eli Gosnell, the flowing river kept salmon alive until they were harvested or released. We always took only the fish we needed and no more. This technology minimizes harm to salmon as it is a passive capture experience. Fish remain submerged in river water throughout the process so they don't get air exposed or stressed out by the capture event. They also minimize harm to the river and to the water as they're powered by the current so not polluting the waters around them in any way. They're the basis upon which an entire salmon monitoring program has been built in my nation, allowing Niska fish to be well aware of the state of our salmon and they enable selective harvest as was noted by Chief Gosnell. They are genius in many ways and on many levels. And this technology is now combined with modern analytical methods um, for fish stock assessment and monitoring, producing higher quality data and generating more accurate predictions about the fishery than have been previously available. And since 1992, for nearly three decades, Niska Fish has conducted extensive fisheries research on the lower and upper Nass River areas using multiple fish wheels as a platform for fish counting, measuring, tagging, releasing, and recapturing. The Niska Fish Wheel Program has enabled the monitoring of salmon escapement and harvest, the study of factors limiting salmon production, as well as the participation of Niska citizens in the stewardship of the Nass River. And the last thing I'll say here before I turn things over to Will is that I'd like to acknowledge that each of these illustrations that I shared in my section were ones that I've commissioned from a graphic illustrator, Nicole Marie Burton, illustrator of The Boy Who Walked Backwards and Enemy Alien, among many other books and projects. And I simply love working with artists to bring my fisheries science and related thinking to life. So thank you to Nicole. Thank you everyone for being here and over to you, Will. Andrea, thank you for that. Spencer, both of you, like, how do I follow that? I have no idea, but I'm gonna share my screen and I will get started. Thanks everybody. So we've heard a lot tonight about uh, indigenous worldviews, indigenous resource management, um, and really the sort of motivations and values that drove the development of those systems. And what I'm gonna to talk to you tonight about is how we can understand the functioning of those systems, the tools and methodologies, the values and the principles of indigenous salmon management and consider them and apply them in the contemporary context to address really pervasive conservation uh, and recovery challenges that wild salmon face throughout British Columbia and really throughout most of their range today. And some of these indigenous technologies include fish wheels, as Andrew just mentioned, intertidal fish traps, weirs, uh, reef netting and seine netting, as well as dip netting, and a huge variety of other technologies. And one of the really uh, important parts of those technologies is that they are, you know, many of them are selective. They're very place-based technologies, uh, and they are developed over 10,000 or more years of interdependence with salmon. And so really the last 150 or 200 years of salmon management as we now know it is a tiny blip in the history of salmon people relationships in the Pacific Northwest. And those historical and ongoing relationships between indigenous people and salmon were really disrupted uh, intentionally uh, during the process of colonization and the assertion of control by the Canadian and US governments over resource management, development, and decision-making uh, in this part of the Pacific Ocean. 
And this process started about 150 years ago, as I say, and really as the industry grew and, and, and grew in its economic importance and its influence in British Columbia in particular, weirs and fish traps were viewed as a real fundamental threat to uh, the interests of this nascent canning and commercial fishing industry. And so uh, many indigenous fishing technologies were banned and criminalized uh, and were largely sort of discontinued from active use throughout much of the early 20th century. And of course, that transformation and displacement of millennia old indigenous management systems led to a fundamental reorganization of salmon fishing and how we do it to, the, to a modern fishery that is largely dependent on mixed stock fisheries. Mixed stock fisheries are fisheries that intercept you know, dozens, if not hundreds of co-migrating populations of salmon and which uh, sort of distribute the impacts and benefits of fishing uh, very differently than uh, these traditional management systems. Okay, so where was I? I was saying basically that um, in the last 150 years, we've seen a really fundamental reorganization of salmon fisheries, who has access, who has control, and where the benefits of those fisheries are distributed. Uh, and what we see largely now is that uh, fish are caught in the marine environment. A lot of them are caught on the west coast of Vancouver Island. A lot of them are caught in Northern British Columbia. And a lot of them are caught in Southeast Alaska, often hundreds of miles away from their natal river. And these fish are managed by a complex and bureaucratic set of bilateral relationships between the United States and Canada, uh, which really have largely sapped control from local communities, whether they are indigenous or simply coastal communities that are relying on fishing for their livelihoods. Uh, and this bureaucracy really severs the link between fishers and decision-making and disempowers local people. And we've seen the consequences of that really throughout the range of salmon in terms of the negative sort of displacement of local fishing opportunity as a driver of livelihoods and food security. Mixed stock fisheries also have high incidental harvest of non-target species and populations. And that matters a lot when we have numerous populations of Kosiwik and ESA listed uh, salmon co-migrating with healthy or hatchery enhanced populations um, that are targeted in fisheries. We also have a mobile fishing fleet where we can see hundreds of boats converge on, on an individual area during a, a brief opening um, that can have tremendous impacts. And we see that a lot on the central coast in the area eight fishery. There's often you know, up to 300 boats participating. You'll see high rates of humpback entanglement and thousands of fish being caught in a single day long opening. And, and that mixed stock harvest also masks declines and really reduces uh, the incentives to minimize over harvest or habitat loss. Um, and then finally, you know, surprisingly, given all the money that we spend and the sort of giant bureaucratic complexity of salmon management, uh, there's a real absence of catch data on the population level. So we actually don't know for many salmon populations throughout the range, how many of them are caught in high seas fisheries. We make certain assumptions about uh, tagged indicator stocks or based on one single year or a few years of genetic data, but by and large, we actually don't know exactly how many salmon are being caught in fisheries today. And that limits our ability to make informed decisions, whether that's in season adaptive management, whether that's spatial closures, or whether that's fundamental reorganization of how commercial, recreational, uh, and tribal fisheries occur. And as I mentioned, you know, this period of 150 years, it's really a blip on the map, but it has been a period that has coincided with a major collapse in opportunities and in the benefits uh, for people's food and livelihoods that salmon are able to provide. And this is a graph on the left of a time series of salmon catch in fisheries throughout British Columbia from 1925 to the present day. And concurrent with these declines has come a loss uh, in the viability of salmon-based livelihoods in coastal communities. So these fish, which formerly were the foundation of people's economy and subsistence, uh, have been reduced to a, a commercial commodity that is harvested uh, by 2,000 individual licenses, about half as many as fished in British Columbia in 1985, uh, not to mention the, the loss of opportunities for food fishing uh, and for cultural access for Indigenous and non-Indigenous people alike. So we really have seen the manifestation of, um, you know, the system that we built. And in several important ways, Indigenous fisheries, you know, differ from 
uh, modern mixed stock fisheries. And the first really fundamental one is that they, their scale is very different. Very often indigenous fishing technologies targeted a single stock or a handful of local stocks um, at some point in their migration, which meant that people had much tighter control of the fishery that they were conducting, as well as much sort of more intimate understanding of the impacts of that fishery on the individual stock. Importantly also, you know, harvest and this process of stewardship of salmon were sort of inexorably linked, which meant that, uh, and still means today, I'll mention that, uh, you know, indigenous people and other people who are harvesting salmon are, are a part of that re reciprocal relationship uh, between salmon and people, which comes with a set of responsibilities uh, to see to it that the next generation of salmon are able to continue that legacy uh, for future generations of people and for the ecosystem. And then finally, you know, place-based fisheries really incentivize stewardship. We heard from Spencer, we heard from Andrea that, you know, respect for salmon as the foundation of indigenous uh, cultures on the BC coast really meant that people depended on salmon for their very survival. And that creates a different set of motivations and a different set of perspectives uh, and time horizons for salmon management. And so sort of shifting away, I, I'd like to focus on a bit of a, a case study um, from the Quay River where I've worked for the last 10 years. And the Quay River is on the central coast of BC. It drains into Fitzhugh Sound uh, and it's a major cultural site for the Helsinki Nation. It's 180 square kilometer watershed uh, and prior to the initiation of this project by the Helsinki Nation in 2012, sockeye and other salmon species were quite poorly monitored in the watershed. Now, another important aspect of the Quay River is that it's home to the Quay Camp, which is a Helsinki summer camp and cultural program, uh, which has been run in the Quay River for the last 25 years. And in sort of initiating a program to better understand sockeye salmon populations and to inform management by the Helsic uh, Integrated Resource Management Department, we wanted to build a program that really braided uh, local Helsic traditions in salmon stewardship and management and harvest with, uh, you know, sort of modern scientific methodologies of mark recapture or other methods that are used to quantitatively enumerate salmon populations. And prior to 2012, when this project had started, you know, weir stakes had been found at several sites uh, within Helsic territory but there was no living memory of the practice of weir building. So this project had the dual purpose of, you know, providing data on a very important sockeye salmon population, as well as being really a renewal or revival of that tradition of building weirs. And so, as I mentioned, since 2012, we've run uh, a weir in the Lower Quay River, and this is the original weir here that you see. Uh, it's made of split cedar and locally harvested cedar logs. Uh, and it's a very simple construction, basically deck screws and twine and uh, rocks and wood. And we use that um, until 2018 to monitor sockeye salmon abundance uh, using a mark recapture study. And, um, you know, the WEIR program is also providing a whole host of other benefits. Sorry, I skipped forward a little too fast, uh, including uh, opportunities for outreach to health sick students and other visitors, as well as employment uh, particularly for young people who may have interest in the fisheries field, uh, as well as other community members, both as a place of employment, but also as a place to have access to sockeye salmon. And it's also become a real touchstone in the community. And so when, you know, our staff or myself are in Bella Bella for a few days, people will ask us, you know, how is the sockeye run looking? Uh, and people are, there's a real sense of pride in the, in the fact that the nation has really sort of reinvigorated this practice and is now, um, really kind of leading the conversation about how do we manage sockeye salmon in the Quay River? How do we manage sockeye salmon and other salmon on the Central Coast? And then like one of the last real tangible benefits of this project is that in the process of capturing and tagging, you know, three to 500 salmon every summer for our mark recapture study, uh, we also get our hands on enough fish for folks to take some back to the community for the Quay camp to have, you know, a hundred or so sockeye every summer for jarring and to teach kids how to use the smokehouse. Uh, and then we also bring some fish back into the community for elders. So this is a project that is multifaceted and really, I think like a, a lot of science projects needs to think about, you know, what other benefits can we provide and how are we connecting to, you know, the social, cultural and economic well-being of people in relation to salmon because really salmon are a very, the relationships are what make salmon so special and what will ultimately uh, make or break the ability of salmon to continue to be a sustainable 
uh, resource for all people in this part of the world. Oh, and then one piece I wanted to talk about tonight, actually really quickly, is just an exciting new project at the Quay Weir where we're, we've got uh, video cameras and uh, we're working with computer scientists from Simon Fraser University uh, to train a computer vision model, so an AI model that will automate salmon counting and species identification. Uh, and that's gonna be really powerful because what it'll do is it'll give us uh, daily estimates of how many salmon have come into the Quay River. Uh, and that can be really important information for the nation as they uh, work with DFO to collaboratively manage commercial um, fisheries in Fitzhugh Sound, recreational fisheries in Fitzhugh Sound, and as the health sector manage their own food and subsistence fishery. So um, really kind of connecting cutting edge technology with this ancient practice of building weirs and still making sure that people are able to, um, you know, work and live by the river and, and keep that relationship strong. Uh, and with that, I will um, stop sharing my screen. In that talk, that was wonderful and like incredibly inspirational. Uh, the way you speak about salmon as being not, uh, not a resource, but relatives and that the harvest has to also be good for the salmon. And, and you don't typically hear fisheries managers talking about how the harvest has to be good for the salmon as well. So really appreciated your perspective on that.